Hello and welcome to the See Me Be Me podcast. Today we are joined by another very special guest, Ade Malajo, who is a Black British Nigerian founder and a very well seasoned tech entrepreneur with 13 years, sorry, 15 years of a track record of building innovative ventures, which span from technologies like uh, artificial intelligence. Um, with experience as a freelance tech contra contractor, working with many, many small businesses, leading a successful insur insurance tech startup from bootstrap beginnings to incubators to growing revenues, award nominations and media attention, Ade, Ade has achieved a lot and is currently on an exciting new adventure exploring immersed in the world of AI, driving MyKeys.ai, a tech startup that's revolution how, revolutionizing how businesses integrate AI into their workforce strategies. Welcome to the CV Beanie podcast, Ade. How are you both doing? Good to be here. Very well, thank you. Thank Reasonable you. Thank you. So yeah, yeah. AI is the new buzzword that's that's going about uh, in today, but mm. it comes back even way, way before. Um, AI has been going for a very, very uh, long time, but yeah, yeah, now only reaching media attention. How long have you been immersed within the AI field? Flat out, very short period of time. I'll be perfectly honest with you. AI for me is, as we've gone through you know, the dot com to whatever technologies in between and where we are today with AI, AI has always been a buzzword. Like over the years, it's been a buzzword. It's been all those things that you throw in into your pitch deck to say, we've, we sprinkled on a little AI, we sprinkled in a little bit of machine learning just because yeah. it was it was exciting to people. But as you probably know, there was a period of time, maybe five years ago where chatbots were all the rage, but they were trash. They, they, they were basically just, you know, um, de decision trees. It was just pre determined outcomes to base on what you said. Now, you guys, I'm sure you, you guys at the forefront of tech, November 2022 happened and we all saw ChatGPT and it, it changed everything. I went from being a guy who said that AI was kind of nonsense and a buzzword to literally having my socks blown off. Like I'd never seen anything so impressive and so repeatedly impressive. And it really changed everything about how I looked at things. So in terms of flat out AI, I'm, I'm relatively new to the space, but I'm bringing my experiences in other things and what I know about businesses to a new platform. And that's what we're building with MyPeace.ai. So, so, so take us back to the very beginning. So yeah. like I growing up as a kid, we always yeah. worked in computers. Did you always feel like that this is the kind of career that I want to get into? Cliches. I want to be immersed in the tech space or? I'm a fully a cliche major cliche so i grew up in manchester as you guys did i went yeah. to school in disbury then i went to secondary in uh, manchester in fallowfield a uh, place called mgs but um i was one of those kids that was buying in fallowfield those little sherbet sticks and flogging them at school and playground like it, it sounds cliche as hell but it's just it's just the reality it just drops in the background for there. yeah so flipping you know anything cheap for a little bit of profit because you know there's restricted as to how you can get outside of school when you're a 12 year old so yeah. you know st standard story there but technology is something that's just always excited me i remember being let's say nine years old and my brother who actually ended up being a surgeon we had this thing called an amstrad cpc 464 so a uh, shout out to alan sugar so this was a an old school computer and it had a tape drive that's how you used to play games that's how you used to run programs and back then they actually gave you a book that taught you how to program things. And my older brother who's eight years older than me showed me what he was doing. And I was pretty much hooked on the whole idea of uh, you know, writing programs, playing games, actually tinkering with the things. So yeah, I was always a kid who was interested in selling things, trying to make money. I've, I've made money and I've lost money and I've failed many times, but you know, we always get back on that horse. But technology has always been the thing that excited me. I actually remember, I don't know if you guys are a bit younger than me, but if you remember Blue Peter? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So I remember on Blue Peter in 1995 when I was nine years old and they showed the release of Windows 95. This is not exciting, but to me at the time, I remember seeing the boxes going by on a, on a conveyor belt and I was like, that's crazy. And I remember Bill Gates becoming the richest man in the world and I was like, yeah, technology and making money. Yeah, that's, that's, that's me. I want a bit of that. So that's, that's, where, that's where I started. 
Now, Ade, what I wanted to ask is, what are some of the, since you've started on your entrepreneurial uh, journey, what are some of the main challenges and obstacles that you face, especially as a, a black founder? As a black founder. I think anyone from our kind of, whatever you want to call it, BAME minority background understands is, especially as a, especially as a young black male, there's a, there's an almost an expectation of not much. So yeah. even growing up, going to school, you go through a school year, I was pretty academically gifted without trying to be funny, but I was very good at academics, but I'd feel like every year it was almost like you proved yourself to a new set of teachers who yeah. it was pretty, yeah. it was pretty tangible that they didn't expect much. And I think that's something that a lot of kids have had to go through and a lot of kids have had to accept and some got discouraged, some didn't. Some just took it in their stride. And I think it's one of those people that just took it in my stride. But that's one of those weird things where some people would get put off things. I've got a I've got a good friend who I remember, he's now a doctor, being told, why would he bother applying to medical school? This is a guy who, in his ECC, straight A's, literally a straight A student, being told, why would you apply to medical school? Maybe try something different. So this oh. is a, a common experience that, that a lot of us have had. So it's not special to me. But even at the beginning, I think people need to realize the impact they have on young people. And how you can limit what they think they can achieve. Now, Adi, what, what I wanted to ask from the beginning of your entrepreneurial career to where you are now, how much, how have you seen tech change over your career? You're going to really betray how old I am, my friend. <laughs> uh, so I felt like I missed out on the dot com boom yeah. because I was 14. You guys were probably in primary school. I don't know. You guys look young. Maybe that's maybe it's just black don't crack. I don't know. But <laughs> I saw I saw AOL sending out CDs in the mail for us to sign up to the internet. I was there on dial up here in the doo -doo 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 -doo, all that nonsense mm -hmm. on the on the internet. Yeah. So I enjoyed that part of the journey and thinking I'd missed out on e-com because Jeff was doing what he was doing with Amazon and we were doing early orders. And I was like, I can't believe I'm a kid and I'm in school and I, and I don't get to be a king of the internet. And I saw 2001 happen and the dot-com, you know, all go to dust. And then I saw the rise of social three years later. It wasn't a long time. So just people always need to know that there will always be run-ups. There will always be crashes. There will always be a next thing. So then I saw social be everything and every company had to have a social angle and virality. And it's true, they do. But then people thought they missed out on social. Yeah. And then I saw the crazy run-ups in several cycles of, of crypto and blockchain and distributed technologies and all these things and how it's life-changing. And if I don't drop out of college now and go and build something now, I've wow. missed it. And now we're seeing generative AI. It's like, what I'm trying to really get at is there's always a new technology. So if there's a young person watching this, I don't back you to drop out about out of uni before you have some kind of qualifications, like especially if you look like we do, get that yeah. degree, get the skills, get exposed in all the programs that there are probably for what people are calling a DEI. If, if you can get yourself in a door for something because they're trying to help you, take that by all means. So I've seen every iteration of tech along the last, what, 20 years? There's always something new and they're all important and they all compound and they all build on top of each other. There's going to be something after generative AI. So yeah, I, I've, I've witnessed and I've bathed in the, you know, the, the pool of, of, of technology because it, it all builds on top of, of, of itself and keeps going. Amazing. Amazing. So speaking about the evolution of AI, yeah. tell us about mypeas.ai, your current project and what, what are you doing and what are your plans? Yeah. Business. So when COVID happened, I, I was going to tell you a bit of a story because I don't want to, you know, shoot my shot too too quick. Um, when COVID happened, compare checker business models changed. It went from being something that was, you know, it grew three hundred percent. I learned so much about social media marketing. It was like one of those things where you you throw money in and, and money came out the other side, and it, and it was fantastic. But business models changed. People were tightening their belts in twenty twenty everyone decided to do one thing in my industry at the same time. And it meant that it was no longer what we call in accounting a going concern. So essentially we had to sunset that business. So that was what led me into the crypto space. Had fun there. I'm sure we'll come back to that later. So back to the AI thing. The reason why I stumbled on AI was just, I was kicking the tires on new ideas on what I was going to do next. And I thought it was going to be something in healthcare. I come from a family that's very um health oriented so my, my dad's a cardiologist my brother's plastic surgeon my mum was a scientist and then became a, a pharmacist so 
healthcare was just something that was, you know, it, it almost seemed like, like it was a natural fit. I was using generative AI a lot in kicking the tires on an idea. I, you know, did, did the, the early steps of, okay, we're going to go out, see what the market thinks of this. We're going to see if we can get people on board, see if we can get customers. Throw up a Spotify store, no, no product, but idea, shoot some content, see how the market reacts. Market reacted positively. I started to get some sales in the door and I started to get a lot of people signed up for things like newsletters and waiting lists. So you're like, th those are general, general good signs. But when I tried to move forward, I found that the conversion on uh, idea, interest to sales just wasn't there. Just wasn't there. And it's disappointing, but it is what it is. You do these things over and over again. Some of them work, some of them don't. And then you move on to the next thing. What I took away from the whole experience was that generative AI blew my mind. I was asking these things questions relentlessly throughout the day. I was generating content relentlessly. It was an improvement in productivity that I couldn't have ever imagined and allowed me to do things on the technical side that like, I just wouldn't have understood. What a lot of people who can code and build things do is they spend a lot of their time just Googling. It's, yeah. it's a Google fest. Like you start with some issue that you have, or it's an error message or trying to figure out how to do something. You Google it and then you end up on Stack Overflow. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but it's this whole repository, like unbelievable repository of people's problems, questions and answers. So you end up then having to try and figure out how a question that has been answered in the past kind of fits with what you're trying to do. And one thing people don't realize is engineers are not teachers. They don't particularly want to help you if they don't think you've put in the work to have your answer answered. So mm -hmm. you can ask your own question and not get enough answers because you don't have enough juice on the platform, or you can try and shoehorn what someone else has had answered into your space. This is not the most efficient way of figuring out a complex problem, but yeah. with generative AI, whether or not you agree with it, they've basically just eaten Stack Overflow. It understands every answer, every question, every problem that's ever happened. So now you're in a position where you're just asking questions that are 100% specifically your issue, your error message. And this AI understands that and is instantly giving you suggestions and even code. And I was just like, this, this isn't just about code. This is about everything. Yeah. And I hear people on a daily basis on social media, whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter, say, ChatGPT is trash. ChatGPT doesn't give me anything useful. ChatGPT is this and that. And I'm just like, <laughs> I hate to say it to you, Susan or Bob. It's you that's the problem. You're prompting it poorly. You're yeah. giving it bad requests and you're getting bad answers. And you want to say it's the AI when actually it's you. Yeah. Now, this is why after months of me just hammering these things to the point where they're like, yo, mate, give it a break. I'm not even joking. I have literal screenshots of ChatGPT or Gemini or Bard, whatever the chat button I'm using at the time is like, yeah, you you've uh, you need to stop because we're sick of answering your questions. Let, let the rest of the world have a go. So after that, I was just like, I, I know what's coming. That That's yeah. just how I felt. And I see other people who are big in the technology space around the world say things which are similar to what I'm saying. I don't know if you've heard of a guy called Chamath Palahapitiya. He's yes. a bit, yeah. So Ch Chamath was, exactly. But Chamath yeah. was recently talking about how he doesn't think that it's, in AI, everybody's obsessed with NVIDIA and everybody's obsessed with all the large language models that are being made, being funded, these insane valuations. But he was saying, that if you have an analogy of, say, refrigeration, yeah. that's what he thinks large language models and the chipsets are. They're the, the picks and shovels. And most time people think in a gold rush, it's the people selling the picks and shovels which make all the money. And he's like, that's not strictly true. Refrigeration is a game changer because it allows you to keep all kinds of foods you know, going for long periods of time. But Coca-Cola has made more money with more profit margin than any refrigeration business ever has or ever will. And what he was trying to get at is the application layer on AI is the thing where the most value is going to be accrued. It's a 50-50 thing where the large language models are going to make a huge amount of money, yeah. but there's going to be maybe four major large language models, which will be shared by all these application developers, all, the, all these enterprises to do certain things. But there will be literally hundreds, if not thousands, of major businesses made on the application layer, which uses these things, and they will accrue the other half of that money. 
So would you rather bet that you can make one of three businesses or that you can make one of the massive businesses of the thousands who are going to make billions? It, God knows. We, we, we never thought in trillions, but we do now. So this is where I saw my entry point for my piece that AI. So he's saying it's not about the large language models. People are saying it's not necessarily about prompt engineering because that's going to get easier and easier as these models are get better at understanding humans. And my point of view is prompt engineers are going to be necessary, but yeah. we're going to, we're going to build user interfaces around special prompts so that you don't even know uh -huh. you're prompting. You're just yeah. doing a workflow and you're getting the AI to do something special as a result of that workflow. So the reason why the company is called MyPeas.ai is it's my prompt engineering assistance, because I believe that companies like, say, for example, Jasper, which is a social kind of media marketing uh, AI that people think is kind of had its lunch eaten by ChatGPT being made free. I yeah. don't agree with that. A company like Jasper makes money because it gives you an interface to maximize your outputs for your purposes of, of marketing. So to me, that is a prompt engineering assistant. And I think all of the application layer are prompt engineering assistants. So the idea is that my P's will make it easy for companies in many industries to put in things like their job descriptions, their OKRs, and figure out where into their, into their workflows, generative AI, AI tools, automations will fit so that they can maximize their productivity and and you know connect them with consultants to you know take that even further if if needs be now that is where we are focused as as a product i know it's a long story but i had to get you there in the end what yeah. what, what what would you say are some of the, the the common misconceptions that people may have about ai i don't think they're misconceptions i think if you as i said earlier if you prompt badly you'll get a yeah. bad output. And that's always been true with computers. Bad, imp yeah. bad input, bad output. I think the statement, AI is not going to replace your job, somebody using AI is, yeah. is half true. I think AI is going to replace a lot of people's jobs, but not as in there will be no humans left in the loop. I think in the meantime, it's going to be more so a team of three replacing a team of seven. Mm. So you're going to want to be one of those three that gets AI and not one of the four who didn't. And what would be your advice to a small business owner who, you know, they, you know, they, I think that their only tech is that they have a social media presence. That's all, all they do. But how can they be, how can small business owners be looking at adopting these new and emerging technologies to grow their businesses? So I've been a small business owner, you know? I've never had a business that had 50, 100 employees. Mm. But one of the things I did learn was scale can happen if you don't need manpower to do your business. So, so the reason why I love software is if you make an app that does something really useful for lots of people, you can do it 10 times or you can do it 10,000 times and it doesn't make much difference. But in order to get 10,000 people to use it, you need to have scale in your marketing practices. So a small business that just has a social media presence needs to up the content they put out so that they can latch on to latch onto business at lower cost. They need to be running ads on whatever platform is currently giving you the cheapest engagement and the, the cheapest reach and the cheapest ad spend. But in order to do that, you need to be making content, whether that is, um, you know, free content or if it's the content that makes up ad copy. And the thing is, the reality is, AI is very good at all of those things. So you're going to get maximum bang for buck in terms of if it is employing an agency who's going to be using AI or you have a marketing person who needs to who needs to make 100 pieces of content, but you know they're used to making five in a day because you know physically figuring out these things you know manually takes more time. That's how a small business can end up scaling up because they're using a force multiplier. And that, that's what AI is. Well, next uh, question I wanted to ask, um, Adi, it just particularly from going through your bio, you highlighted the, the need of uh, resilience within your career. So could you share with us, like, particularly a, like a challenging, let's say, scenario in, like, your journey as an entrepreneur and how you persevered through it? 
using their resilience. Yeah. So this is the kind of answer I would never give in an interview if it was to get a job because it says a lot about, you know, my personality. I think if you're a business person to a degree, you're a gambler because you're gambling on yourself in a way that other people aren't. Other people go to work every day and they work hard and there's no disputing that. Everybody works hard. But the idea is that somebody else makes the money and they get paid for their contribution to what it is that's required to make the money. When you're an entrepreneur, you're basically saying, I'm going to work hard, but money has to come. Yeah. And whether or not I make, whether or not I work hard or not, money still needs to come as to whether or not I, I can survive. So I've done that a lot in business and, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But the biggest resilience I ever had to face was when I went down that crypto rabbit hole. Uh, in 2021, I saw one of the, I saw an opportunity that, you know, it was four years in the making yeah. and I ended up, you know, making an, un, an ungodly amount of money in that, in that, in that time doing something, which essentially is, essentially is gambling, but came from research and, you know, experiences, but the world went through COVID. It's a black swan event. No one had ever seen coming, um, money printing, just insane environment that we've ever seen. Mm. Long story short. I made and lost over a million dollars and wow. I've lost money before in business because, you know, sometimes you run ads, you, you don't get the return on investment you expect. That yeah. is what it is for a lot of people losing 5,000 in marketing is, is a tough pill to swallow. Seeing the largest amount of assets you've ever seen and then making some poor decisions and some greed and, you know, some things like that, losing Essentially, unrealized gains, essentially. Yeah. You, it, that, that is a real loss. I've seen people do terrible things to themselves in that space for a 50th of, of, of the balance, you know? So I learned a lot about, about what greed is, and, and, and greed is, is very normal. I learned a lot about accepting that, that you've lost something. And I learned a lot about just just getting back up yeah. and on to, on to the next thing. So it's not the answer you're probably expecting because you know I've run several businesses and resilience is is normal in any business because business is hard, but it's a lot harder to lose something to have never than to have never had it. And m most businesses don't put you in a position where it can be here today, gone tomorrow, in such an aggressive and protracted you know time frame. So. It's regrettable, but it's probably one of the most interesting 18 months, three years, periods of my life. I've, I, could, I probably will never experience anything like that again, but it taught me lessons. I can tell you that for sure. And do you know what? Speaking about the lessons, normally I ask the question, what would you tell your younger self? Well, if you could go back three years ago and speak to uh, yourself from three years ago, what piece of advice would you have given yourself? Or would you have just said, you know what? There's no advice given. Just ride through that journey. Are we talking about three years before the loss or three years because that I'd be in the midst of the loss? Actually, yeah. But yeah, in the midst of the loss, yeah. yeah. Um, in the midst of the loss, I would just, I would say to that person that there are more important things in life than money. Mm. And, and I think, I think I've always known that. But now I really know that. You know what I mean? It's one thing to say money's not everything yeah. to someone to someone when you haven't lost anything. But when you have lost a lot of money, you then realize that I would never trade a loved one for that money. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that sounds almost, you know, f fluffy and, you know, warm thing to say. It's a what a nice person to say. But at 100% it's true. I would, there's no family member I, I would trade for, to get that money. Like, it's just money. If you did it once, you can do it again. again but also yeah. realize you could lose it again. So the lesson is in knowing what greed looks like and what it feels like. There's a yeah. euphoria in that kind of protracted version of greed that most people will never experience. And it that that's a hell of a lesson. Like, be, like there's an invincibility in the in the midst of the euphoria that you need to recognize so that if you're ever in a position like that again i don't i don't think that the only preparation for that is is the loss 
And so the only advice I'd give to that person three years ago in the midst of it is it's just money. I was I was going to say, you know, it is like an invincibility. Like after going through that period, you know, five grand, 10 grand, whatever, is yeah. almost like nothing. Like, oh, whatever. Like, yeah. Yeah. Been there, and you just like, I can take on the world now. For a lot of entrepreneurs, they go into it. They go into entrepreneurship because they think they're creative, and they feel like, either whether it's product or whether it's something that they create, and that's all that they have to focus on, is going to you know carry them to the promised land. And to a degree, it makes sense because if if you can do something no one else can do, you can probably find that boring business guy that you know is cookie cutter and can can slot in and can figure out your strategy. And what needs to be done on terms of you know analytics and data but at the heart of it data is massively important your creativity eventually be, will become a commodity like there's there's no level of, of creativity that eventually someone who doesn't have your level won't be able to copy because you put it into the marketplace so knowing that you have the data behind things like your crm so how how you deal with customers in terms of you know your, your sales funnel and knowing where they're coming from knowing where they're dropping off in in your sales process knowing how your marketing strategies are you know which areas of them are particularly profitable which aren't what what conversion rate data is super important for you to make any analytical decision people think they're doing analysis because they've you know they've, they've studied business and then it's like, okay, well, this is what the strategy will be because X, Y, and Z says this in this paper or this case study. But your business is very individual. So you need to constantly be collecting data about everything that happens to your business from your customer in your market because there, there is no case study for that. You are the case study. So it really is just a matter of always looking at how you can collect data, how your dashboards are updating everyone in your sales, your marketing passing that in uh, product back to the people who are actually doing the engineering because you can't really make analytical decisions unless you have all the, all the data on, on hand. So it's not that I'm some strategic mastermind. It's just knowing what you're talking about because there is data behind it. There is data to back it up. It's not, it's not, you know, seeing what, what, which direction the wind's blowing. It really is a matter of the data says this, I have to listen to that data and analyze that data because there, there is nothing else. Yeah, I, I think there's some uh, some hidden and great gems with, within this podcast, uh, <laughs> and especially for a lot of young people who you know this gen. So actually, that's a good question. What do you think about this this current generation of young yeah. people who you know probably you know my obviously us growing up in the South, we were involved in tech, but you know what people looking back now our, our tech is like outdated whereas these guys are now immersed with you know the social media generation every young person from the age of 10 has got one of these devices um, you know, I, I feel i feel for them yeah what <laughs> i feel for them not not for the reasons that you that you're thinking I, but i feel for them because i don't actually think their exposure to technology is, is what people think it is when we were coming up technology wasn't so encapsulated and you can't really push on it and see what pops out the other side. Now it really is just, you receive your phone, you can't do anything with it because Apple's locked it down. You play with an app, you can't really mm -hmm. build an app because you need you need an Apple laptop and you need an Apple developer account, you need this. It's not the same experience as it was for us where you really could build something very easily because it was almost like unfinished. Like I feel like theirs is a very sanitized version of technology. Yeah. So I kind of feel for them. Yeah, I don't know. It's quite a lot in, in this generation. Like when we were growing up, we would still, although we would be on the computers or playing PlayStation, we'd still go out and play out on the street. Whereas, yeah, I don't see. I mean, a lot of kids play now just through online gaming now. And yeah, yeah. which which I which I'm not against by any stretch of the imagination. And it's just you know everything does change, but I just think their ability to build their own next thing is being hampered by everything being so closed. I think what we're going to do now is head over to the bonus part, yeah. bonus questions yeah. part of the podcast, where we're going to ask you four fun questions, um, to which the first one is the most important one, because if you don't give me the correct answer, yeah, we I won't so. continue with the remaining <laughs> three. And just to crash straight into that first question, Nadine, please tell me 
you will give you the right answer. Does pineapple belong on a pizza? Uh, qualifying question. You ever been to Hawaii? Yes, I have. <laughs> then uh, the problem is, I actually I don't hate Hawaiian pizza, but uh, yes, it does belong on a pizza if you like it. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be oh. my choice, but uh, it wouldn't be my choice. But I have eaten it; like it is what it is. <laughs> oh, no, I have to take the pineapple off the pizza. Just to, uh, yeah, it just doesn't go well for me. Um, all I'm saying is, if I go to a pizza buffet, occasionally I'll have a I'll have a pineapple on a pizza. <laughs> so I guess that's I guess I guess that wraps up the uh, podcast. I'm, I'm that up. wraps it up. <laughs> it started off so well, and it's just yeah. ended in misery. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. We're going to yeah, continue. Course. We're going to continue. If you could throw a dinner party tonight, you can invite yeah. three guests from yeah. uh, from history or today. Who would you invite? Wow. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I don't really care about like major figures in history, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. So it's a figure in my history. I'll take you back to 2007. Yeah. I want to have dinner with the characters in Entourage. I want to be part of the Entourage for one night. <laughs> so me, Vinny, E, Drama, <laughs> Turtle. I want to go out in the town in L.A., as a member of Entourage and just tear it up. That's my answer. It's so funny to me because I've literally only just started watching Entourage. Oh. I um, feel bad it, for you because you need to be 20 to really appreciate Entourage. Because uh, it's I so childish. But it's like it it's like child it's childish male fantasy. <laughs> and it only really gets you like as a 20-year-old in university watching this, we thought this was the best thing that has ever happened. <laughs> like so if I could go back to then and be part of the entourage for a night, yeah, that, that would make my year. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm only five episodes in, but it's such a great TV show. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Entourage is good, yeah. And I, and I feel like if there's women watching this who don't get what we're saying, it's like, it's like being able to go out and party with Carrie Bradshaw and the girls in Sex and the City. That, that's what Entourage was for us as young men. <laughs> I mean, males and females just, just yeah find a way to watch entourage it's hilarious it's yeah. absolute cracking yeah uh, yeah i was the same i was like oh, i wish i could be partying like that uh <laughs> in la it's not the same here in manchester doing it in manchester no not quite not quite yeah i know that it's been a pleasure to have you on the cbbb podcast been a pleasure being here. Um, and what we do, this final bit of the segment, is that we hand it to our guests to yeah. plug any, the business, social media, whatever. Yeah. You know, it's your chance to have the final say, and it's over to you. Awesome. I've taken a step back on social media. So if you want to follow me, at Ade Milajo on Instagram, by all means do so, but it's not where I do business stuff. LinkedIn, if you want to connect, absolutely find me, Ade Milajo. And if you want to get on the waiting list for mypeas.ai, go to mypeas.ai, M-Y-P-E-A-S.ai. Um, looking forward to more with these guys and whoever want to reach out, by all means do so. Cheers. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, so thank you for listening to this episode of See Me, Be Me podcast. If you liked it, make sure to like, comment, and share this video. And subscribe, obviously. Subscribe to the podcast. We're on all the major streaming platforms. And obviously, stay tuned for another exciting episode of CBBB. Take it easy, everyone. Thanks for listening, everyone. Take care. Cheers. Bye.